Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill T. Jones. Don't believe it, I'm not cool and smiling. I'm scared to death. <laughs> but you know that, you're all performing people, so you work with a lot of scared artists, don't you? But you make us brave, right? So, we start. We start making and doing what? Doing and making what? We had made an opus it was going to be about my nephew, Lance Theodore Briggs. Beautiful young dude, now dealing with AIDS. What? Now dealing with big questions about what a life of pleasure has led him to. And it was going to be called Letter to My Nephew. It was going to be done in Paris. It was going to be done in Europe because the presenters said, we need something from you, Bill, to bring out the young folks. <laughs> no, you don't talk that way, do you? <laughs> we need something with not so much goddamn language, he said. So we worked on this thing, and I was going to really, I was going to diss the French, you know? We had just seen all those photos of the people coming from Syria, and I know that we Americans, we open our gates to everybody, right? Ooh. But anyways, the piece was Letter to My Nephew, using the model of James Baldwin, a European, a European journey, and I was going to put my nephew's bed like Frida Kahlo in the middle of a stage and imagine tear gas. This was my postcard and I said imagine people in tear gas in Syria, in Africa, in Ferguson and it was going to be a rumination on the artist from afar. Well, we did it. We opened and the 13th of November, walked outside, the performance was over, and I walked into hell. So we sent the dancers off to Lyon, our next engagement, a music-driven program, no talking. And Bjorn and I got in our motor scooter and we were going to go see the sights in Paris. And everything was closed. The heart was hidden. Dora Amelon, hello, bye bye, 95 year old Jewish woman who discovered at age 19 that there are two kinds of people those who need help those who 
give help. Need help? Give help. Bye bye. So we go to the only museum, and I'm standing looking at a vitrine of ancient Chinese relics. And the first one is a guy that looks like this. And the second one is a guy that looks like this. And the third one is a person of indeterminate gesture and gender, sorry, who looks like this. And the fourth one looks like someone pulling on a raincoat. These are tiny little figures. This rain, I call it. And then, my camera didn't work, and I call this neutral. The next one, is what we would call now a party boy. Was he holding a lantern once? And after the party boy comes a fierce mustachioed god or guardian. What? And the next one is a cool soldier. And I thought he was like my dad saying, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And the last one is holding a lantern. I'm imagining it to be a slave. And he's walking into a dark room. And he's saying, shh. Walk, walk, don't you get weary. Walk, walk, don't you get weary. Walk, walk. Don't you get weary. Jesse Norman taught me that song. She said that when the slaves came from the fields and they could see the barn in the evening and they've been working since dawn and they're singing, walk, walk, don't you get weary. Walk, walk, don't you get weary. Dora, bye bye. Bye. My Angelou said once, being very old is like having AIDS. There ain't no cure. <laughs> bye bye. And my clock is ticking. <sighs> I will. Hell yes! dancing girl, pleasure woman. Do you believe the Japanese? Do you believe the Koreans? Women for pleasure? <laughs> the pleasure boy. I was a boy once. I caused pleasure. a hell of a lot of pain. Walk, walk, don't you get weary. Walk, walk, don't you get weary. So, we go from Lyon to the beautiful wine country of northern Italy. Have you ever walked down the street and the smell of truffles is so strong that you can literally follow it to an exclusive, expensive shop. And we had dinner with very posh Italians. And a woman, one of the few English speakers said, Mr. Obama, he is weak. Mr. Obama, he is weak. We here in Europe don't respect him anymore. Just backstage, I was talking to Daniel and Kathy, 
And I was talking about how hard it is to live up to what she said in her speech this afternoon about the community. The community that we are part of and that we build. And I said, I grew up in an African-American home, God-fearing, but that I had bought the modernist idea that a good artist is an alienated, lonely artist. Are we a community? Walk, walk, don't you get weary. Are presenters alienated? She said no. Others said nothing. I will. Remember the guy who looked as if it was raining? Remember the pose that was neutral? I was so pissed off all these years. I felt that my black body could never be neutral. Was I wrong? I will. Oh, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The clock is ticking. Old age is like having AIDS. There ain't no cure. Hell yes. Are we a community? Making? Doing? Those who need help? Those who give help? Our hearts are open, our boundaries are open. No red, no blue in the art world, right? No red, no blue. What color are we, folks? Neutral. I did this piece downtown, or a version of it, with Y music. The writer in the Times said, he's so loud. Drop it. MRI. Eyewitness News, Chicago. Happy child. Child after the liberation. Walk, walk, don't get weary. Walk, walk. business. The clock is ticking. I will. Hell yeah.
Don't you get rid of walk, walk, don't you get Ladies and gentlemen, your APEP NYC 2016 conference co-chairs, Rachel Cohen, Kathy Edwards, and Daniel Bernard Rumain. Welcome everyone, good evening, dear friends, colleagues, and collaborators in the room and online to the opening session of the 59th Annual Conference of the Association of Performing Arts Presenters. Yeah. We are again making a number of this year's conference sessions accessible over the internet courtesy of the HowlRound TV live streaming service. So please be sure to invite your friends, family, and colleagues to our many online offerings and streaming events. Kathy, Rachel, and I have worked hard to bring you a broad, diverse, and inspiring conference. We hope for your enthusiasm, and we welcome your input on our conference. Remember, APAP is about all of us. It has been deeply meaningful for me, as an artist, to serve in the role of conference co-chair for the past two years, and especially this evening to launch this event with a special commissioned performance by my collaborator, brother, and our dear friend, our national treasure, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill T. Jones. Yes. This year's theme, Making, is of course relevant to all of us who create art and engage directly with audiences on a regular basis. But I have come to realize that in this field, we are all makers, with a capital M. From artists, to managers, to agents, to producers and presenters, all of us contribute to our field, our communities, and the enduring enrichment of our arts world. Rachel? Indeed, Daniel. Agents and managers make it possible for work to be presented to a wide range of audiences in communities across the U.S. and around the world. And I have been making my way to New York for every January for the past 25 years. I can't imagine being anywhere else but here to share the learning, the inspiration, the networking, and all-around camaraderie that is only possible through an event like APAP NYC. So much has been already written about our theme, but it's also important to remind everyone of the following. Number one, it's pretty difficult to make anything, including programming, for an event that attracts close to 4,000 people. Without information and inspiration drawn from others, and the three of us were thrilled to be working with individuals you see on the screen. A primary goal of the conference committee is to make certain that today and over the next four days, there are many opportunities to share information and ideas that you can apply directly to your work. Number two, the more we learn and share collectively will make for a stronger field in the future. We hope you will take advantage of the breadth and depth of professional, de professional development sessions that comprise this year's program, and of course, the dynamic keynote speakers that will be with us each day. Number three, three, make time to reach out to all new colleagues, especially those who are joining us from other countries, to build a better understanding of forces that are reshaping the world in which we live. Our co-chair, Kathy Edwards, is expanding her international network as the recently appointed executive director of the New England Foundation for the Arts. Kathy? Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. It's deeply meaningful for me to be here at this conference with so many of the people who advance our nation's creative landscape. The past year has made us all more aware of the need for arts workers to be informed and responsive to communities, to events, and to conflict, both internationally and domestically. Conflict affects the well-being of the artists and the audiences that we serve. Last year, we were struck by unimaginable tragedies. 
from violence taking place in the concert hall at the Bataclan, a space that represents so much that is so beloved to all of us, to violence in the streets of our own communities, where we see that racism and injustice denies the rights and futures of so many of our fellow citizens. But we always hold truth, we always hold dear the truth that our field is uniquely positioned to advance a dialogue about progressive values, about the positive impact of connection, and about the strength of the human spirit. Earlier today, arts presenters hosted a number of pre-conference sessions that focused on many topics, including why and how we in the presenting field can and should make a difference. There are so many good examples of arts organizations and their partners in our field who have effectively brought people together in times of crisis, whether due to political, economic, social, or environmental issues causing setbacks. And over the next few days, we encourage each of you to reserve some time to learn how you can become even more effective in your involvement with communities in making decisions and making a difference through arts-led projects and activities. In addition to reserving time for professional development activities, we know you'll take advantage of the many opportunities to experience live performance, plan for future programming, and hopefully deepen your sense of value and belonging as a member of the Arts Presenters community. We know the next four days can seem daunting, especially for those of you who are here for the first time. So please don't hesitate to introduce yourself to us or any members of the conference committee, arts presenters, staff, or board members. Also, there is an info desk across from registration, and if you need specific information or are feeling lost or need encouragement of some kind, come, we will try to help. Daniel. We also want to acknowledge that this year we are meeting during our country's annual commemoration of the great humanitarian orator, civil and human rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? My friends, let us not forget in the days ahead that at our best, we speak of invitations. We are guided by a mutual, sincere, loving respect. We welcome our responsibilities to those here and those we have lost. And that no matter the roles and risk each of us has or where our work takes us, we all share the same vision to bring the transformative experience of live performance to all people of all ages across the, co the communities we serve. That yes, the arts change and have always saved lives. Rachel? And finally, it goes without saying that it would not be so easy for us to make this event happen so seamlessly every January without the year-round effort of the hardworking APAP team. Let's all give them a hand. They've been responsive to our interests and concerns, and they themselves demonstrate the invaluable process of making, handling the logistics, content, and management of this complicated event. We thank Mario, the staff, and especially the 100 plus volunteers who'll be with us in the days ahead. Kathy? And now, here to share some highlights of what to expect in the days ahead, it's my pleasure to introduce the man who makes the planning hours we spend together so worthwhile, Arts Presenters Vice President of Programs and Resources, Scott Stoner. Thank you all. My sixth grade course director said I had perfect pitch, but 
I'm not going to sing. Well, everyone, it's great to see you uh, all on behalf of the APAP team. I want to say it's truly been a pleasure working with this conference co-chair triumvirate you just met. In addition to being makers, they are true givers. Each gave us an immeasurable level of thought, candor, and inspiration to guide our conference programming over the past two years. So here we are again. Five days, 80 professional development sessions, 370 expo hall booths, 1,000 plus showcase performances and special events, 100 hours, and 6,000 minutes. Are you prepared for this year's amazing Makers Marathon? In addition to layered clothing, comfortable shoes, and perhaps some buffered aspirin, here are a few ideas to highlight on your app or for the technology challenged your printed program. First of all, here in the Grand Ballroom, in a short while, we anticipate what will be a very provocative conversation about truly making the arts matter, led by Anna DeVere Smith. Tomorrow at noon, don't miss our annual plenary session with a very talented group of makers presenting in the Peshaka Shah format, this year moderated by Liz Lerman. Sunday morning at 11 a.m., yes, you will get up Sunday morning, 11 a.m. brings together three marvelous makers from our theatrical world, moderated by Colleen Jennings Rogensack. And on Monday at noon, the annual APAP Awards Luncheon, highlighted this year by opening remarks from Ben Vereen, plus the winner of the Five Minutes to Shine competition and the Award of Merit presentation to Baba Chuck Davis. Around the corner in the Triana Mall Room, first thing tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we bring together colleagues who are working around the world to break through barriers and bring people together through the arts. Hadrian Gerard from Create London will open the session and also, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Ahmad Sarmast, founder of the National Institute of Music in Afghanistan, who miraculously survived a suicide bombing in Kabul just before he was to be with us last year. Also in the Trianon on Tuesday morning, you don't want to miss our closing session with the incomparable Rita Moreno. Please note that we have organized the rest of our professional development sessions over the next three days by the conference theme subtracts make art, make a difference, make decisions, and make money. Good business practice. These are either 50-minute or 80-minute sessions with a common goal of sharing information and ideas between speakers and audience so there's a takeaway you can apply to your own work. In addition, we offer one and one-on-one uh, -on -one and small group consultation salons and mini workshops around grant opportunities, legal issues, and educational outreach. We invite you to part highlight and participate in sessions that are of greatest interest to you between your time spent in the Expo Hall and attending the many showcase performances. Finally, I'll draw your attention to a few special events that again carry forward this year's theme. First is our Five Minutes to Shine competition on Monday morning, a fast-paced series of presentations about audience development strategies that have worked for presenters and artists and exemplify effective practices for building arts audiences as researched by our partners at the Wallace Foundation. New this year is the opportunity to meet and converse with members of APAP's Stellar Artists Committee during an artist salon following the awards luncheon, moderated by Ella Baff, who recently left Jacob's Pillow to take on a leadership role with the Mellon Foundation. And finally, cap off your 2016 APAP curated showcase event, the annual Young Professionals Career Advancement the YIPCA concert which will take place at Merkin Concert Hall on Monday evening. So take your vitamins, make the utmost of your time over the next four days, and my dear colleagues, make the force be with you. <laughs> and now I'm gonna welcome our maker in chief, Mario Garcia Durham. I have to vehemently disagree with Scott. Don't wear comfortable shoes, wear fashionable shoes. <laughs> so thank you, Scott. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year to you all. <laughs> um, thank you, Scott, for that uh, terrific introduction, and congratulations on the terrific program you and the conference committee have made. We appreciate these generous and dedicated members who, together with our hardworking staff, make this annual convening possible. There is another special group of individuals whose support is critically important.
please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude to the many sponsors who provide the critical resources we need to make an event this size so successful. So please join me in thanking our sponsors after I take a brief moment to acknowledge each of them. First, thanks to the generous programming support from our colleagues in the foundation world. These include the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, the American Express Foundation, the British Council of USA, Ford Foundation, the Wallace Foundation, and also we receive annual conference support from the National Endowment for the Arts. We are pleased to welcome a new diamond level sponsor this year and the sponsor of this opening event and our opening reception, Thank You PBS. Also, yes, you can applaud. Thank you. Thank you, PBS. <laughs> <clears throat> also, thanks to our goal level sponsors, including Alan Harris Productions, IMG Artist, Opus 3 Artist, and Starbucks Booking. Our silver level sponsor, oh, applause for that category. Thank you. Our, uh, our silver, silver level sponsors are the Accidental Pervert, CAMI, Canadian Council for the Arts, David Belanzan, Management, ICM Partners, KMP, and at the bronze level, a new sponsor coming in, the City of New York Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, and also for our participating sponsors, Gig Salad, Cawson Talent, Sage Artist, Patron Manager, Pomegranate Artist, we all know how important sponsors are, so please, 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 they're all here. Give them a very, very rousing <laughs> applause. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I am um, I'm truly heartened um, to welcome you here, and thank you for making this annual pilgrimage to APAP each year. I know it's a choice that you make. There is someone else here, though, who represents a large team of dedicated staff who also appreciate the annual gathering of the APAP community, and they are here to serve you. So I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to the general manager of the Hilton, New York Hilton Midtown Hotel, Mr. Laurent Zyren. Laurent? Good evening, everybody. I just wanted to have the opportunity to thank you for being here. We're extremely proud of having you back again this year. It's a huge event for us. It's fun. We enjoy it. Um, the bigger and funnier it gets, the better we do. So it's good to have you with us. Um, we have 1,300 team members. Uh, you can call them team members, but you could easily call them makers as well. That's what we do, and we've tried to make it happen. If it doesn't happen for you over the next four days, you either talk to the guy with the weird accent, that would be me, right? <laughs> or you see any of our 1,300 team members. Thank you very much. Have a great time. At this moment, this is exciting, I'd like to welcome the newcomers who are joining us for the first time. So first timers, please stand up. Please, let's give a warm round of applause. Welcome. Welcome, and I speak on behalf of every member you're surrounded by. Feel free to reach out to any of us if you need support, assistance, advice, etc. We're very happy you're here. So we gather here each year at APAP NYC to do hopefully a lot of business, see and book amazing artists, learn something and share knowledge that may help each of us in our work and life. And to experience this myriad of offerings of this great city, indeed it is a city of makers. As Daniel indicated earlier, this weekend, it is also important that we remember the inspiring work and leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And I can't let this moment pass without stating what many of you also recognize, that black lives matter. Through his own words and through context and content, many of our sessions and events in the following days, we will remember him as a champion for equity, inclusivity, and the victory of the human spirit. With this in mind, I encourage you, more than ever in these troubling times, to make the most of this important opportunity to make new friends and reunite with long-term friends 
that are part of our APAP community. So again, thank you, each and every one of you, for your good work. And thank you again for making the effort and spending your very hard-earned resources to join your APAP family here in New York. And now, I have the great pleasure of introducing someone who makes a difference every day through her leadership at the nation's largest non-commercial media organization with more than 350 member stations. Since her arrival in 2006, Paula Kerger has made particularly strong commitments to education, the arts, news and public affairs, and the use of new technology to reach all Americans. She is also the president of the PBS Foundation, an independent organization that raises private sector funding for PBS and has become a significant source of revenue for new projects at PBS. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Baltimore and serves on the Merrick School of Business Dean's Advisory Council. She is also a director of the International Academy of Television Arts and Sciences and a member of the board of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History and also the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. PBS, as we all know, brings national and international attention to the performing arts in America. And here is a brief reminder before Paula joins us of the breadth of work PBS brings to the American public. Heaven knows you're a dreamer. Welcome, Paula Kerger. <laughs> Thank you. It is so wonderful to be with you this afternoon, but I have to admit, sitting backstage and listening to, gosh, I hope you've been resting. Five days. Wow. Anyway, it sounds like it's going to be an extraordinary meeting, and I'm so very privileged and honored to be asked to help kick off such an important gathering for the arts. As you can imagine, as the president of PBS, we have more than 350 member stations. I travel a lot. I have been all over the country, and I talk to groups everywhere I go. And no matter who I'm speaking to, I always make a point to talk about the importance of the arts for our communities and for our country. I emphasize how important the arts are to our economy, generating over $135 billion in economic activity and supporting over 4 million full-time jobs. And I also talk about how important the arts and creativity more broadly are to the future of our country, ensuring that we remain on the cutting edge of innovation. But I don't think those numbers come close to expressing the true value of the arts or why it's so important that we come together as an artistic community to advocate for more support of the arts. In each of the communities I've visited, I've seen greater art, and I see the bigger impact it has on community. I know from my own experience how enriching the arts can be. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a concert or a play, preoccupied with some issue at work or at home, only to come away with a new perspective. But it's not just me. The arts are what make us human. They feed our soul, they inspire us, they stretch our sense of what's possible. They break down barriers between people and cultures and give us a chance to see the world from many different perspectives. In this time of so many divisions, when people seem intent on isolating themselves from each other or being afraid of seeing how much similarities we have, this is the opportunity the arts offer. I can think of nothing more important than building bridges, 
between different communities and different people and helping all America represent, recognize our common humanity. As President Obama recently said, creativity and the arts have always played a central role in the life of our nation. It is our artists who hold up a mirror to our society, reminding us of our common purpose and our collective obligations. Our art, he said, is an honest reflection of who we really are, a reflection of our successes and our shortcomings, our diversity, our imagination, our restlessness, our stubborn insistence on blending the old with the new, tradition with experimentation. It is this power to bring people together, to break down barriers in language, geography, culture, and yes, even ideology, that I think is so important today. Beyond showing us the world through others' eyes, participation in the arts measurably strengthens communities and promotes civic engagement. This is not just an empty claim. A study conducted by the Performing Arts Research Committee looked at the value of the performing arts in 10 representative communities nationwide. More than 70% of the respondents strongly agreed that exposure to the performing arts helped them better understand other cultures and also agreed that seeing the performing arts live encouraged them to be more creative. The study also showed that people who attend arts events are much more likely to volunteer in their communities. This gets to the core of our work at PBS. In public broadcasting, our job, like yours, is to enrich people's lives. Our 350 local stations have a long history of serving and engaging with their local communities, from their work in early childhood education to their local programming, which reflects the spirit and the needs of their communities. And we think there's a special opportunity to build and serve our communities through the arts. That's why I'm here today. I want to help us develop ways that we can come together and do more. Research from the NEA shows that people who engage with the arts on air or online are three times more likely to attend a live event than non-media users. Television is a powerful medium, but public media is uniquely positioned to translate this power into real impact in our communities because of our local national model. Unlike commercial stations, our local stations are owned by the people they serve. We are committed to building relationships at the local level with you to broadcast your work and help you reach a wider audience. Since I became president of PBS, I've placed a strong emphasis on the importance of the arts, and I'm especially interested in how we can help promote access to the arts in communities all across this country. In public media, our goal is to use the power of media to make the arts available to all, everyone, regardless of their income or where they live should have access to the best music, theater, and dance that are the legacy of this country. At a time when funding for music and arts within our schools is strained, PBS and our member stations are helping to keep the arts alive and for generations to come. By removing economic and geographic barriers, millions of people can experience the worlds of music, dance, theater, and performance including opportunities that might otherwise be available to them except through public broadcasting. During the 2014-2015 season, we offered nearly 600 hours of arts and cultural programming seen by over 110 million people. Let's argue about the fact that there is a great audience for the arts in this country. We like to think that we're able to give people a front row seat and a backstage pass to both the world's greatest cultural experiences, but also an invitation to meet intriguing new artists. Of course, we're not gonna do this alone. We need you, the artists and presenters, to help us shine a spotlight on the great art that's happening right now. We need to strengthen our partnerships so that we can work together to bring more music and drama and performance to the people because it's clear that people are hungry for great art and the work that artists produce. While some may look at the state of the arts in the United States, and especially arts funding, and see reason for disappointment, I also see reason for hope. The National Endowment for the Arts tracks participation in the arts, and while some benchmarks and activities like attendance in opera, jazz has fallen slightly, 
I do see signs of a renaissance in the arts. Slightly over half of all American adults attended a live visual performing arts activity in 2012, according to the latest data from the NEA. And even more importantly, 71% of people of Americans used electronic media to watch or to listen to art, and 44%, this is the most exciting thing, which ties into the theme of your meeting, created, practiced, performed, edited, or remixed art. 44%. New technologies and new platforms are giving us new ways to reach audiences and giving audiences new tools to create art. And people are using these technologies to engage in creative endeavors. This is important because the arts will be our legacy. Civilizations are remembered by the art they've created. The wonderful Beverly Sills called the arts the signature of civilizations. But if this is to be a golden age for the arts, then we have some work to do. We have to help build new bridges between diverse communities and offer new windows of opportunity to see the world through someone else's eyes. We must open people up to the beauty of the world around them and the possibilities that are at each of our fingertips. As presenters and arts presenters and artists, this is our collective task. But as part of this larger artistic community, we don't have to do this alone. Let's join together as partners so that we can expand access to the arts. Let's work together to celebrate the great art being created across this country. And let us build new partnerships between arts organizations so that we can both promote and sustain the arts. Stakes are far too high for us to fight this battle alone. On behalf of all of us in public media, we look forward to working with you to use the power of our platforms to leave a bold signature on the walls of history so that those will say that this is in fact the golden age for art and artistic expression. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. We're so grateful to have your creative and inspiring message to launch this year's annual conference and to compliment our theme makers. And now we have another special treat in store for you, a rare opportunity to hear from four creative thinkers and doers who are making a difference, engaging audiences in thoughtful and meaningful ways. We know that conversations like this are most effective when there's a dynamic and insightful moderator. So we naturally turn to an award-winning actor and recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Fellow Award in addition to the Dorothy and Lillian Gish Prize, two Tony nominations, and two Obies. She is also the founding director of the Institute on the Arts and Civic Dialogue, dedicated to, to supporting artists whose works address social issues and engender civic engagement. She creates theater works in which she plays many characters representing multiple points of view. David Richard wrote in the New York Times that she is the ultimate impressionist. She does people's souls. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator for this evening's conversation, the actor, playwright, and professor, Anna DeVere Smith. Um, thank you so much. Welcome to New York, those of you who are not uh, of our town, and welcome to Makers and to Making the Arts Matter. I want to immediately introduce our panel, uh, who will come out one by one. Would you please welcome Carla Derlikoff Canellis? <laughs> Bill T. Jones. <laughs> and Paula Kerger. Where, where is Paula Kerger? Oh, there she is. Well, I was supposed to bring my water out. I forgot. And I know, does this block your vision, this thing? I guess I won't have it. So, um, Scott, I guess that doesn't work. I'm just going to put it... Okay, I was warned um, that it might not. But anyway, so, look, uh, our president, the President of the United States, ended um, the State of the Union address as follows. That's the America I know. That's the country we love. Clear-eyed, big-hearted, undaunted by challenge. Optimistic, 
that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. That's what makes me so hopeful about our future. I believe in change because I believe in you, the American people. Doesn't that sound like a call out to the arts in this country? And have we ever heard a president talk about con unconditional love? You can Google it, because I'd like to know if anybody else did. And I do think that he was speaking in the wake of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, you know, we, we, we saw, uh, once again, the incredible Bill T. Jones. And Paula, thank you for giving us a frame and also giving people who lead things lots of great things they can repeat in their speeches. <laughs> but we haven't heard anything yet from our mezzo-soprano, uh, Carla Derlikoff Canellis. And I, I, born of a Mexican mother and a Bulgarian father, in her own words, born into a world of cultural confusion, uh, I, I thought that you might start us off by talking about your Duende initiative, because I think the idea of Duende is so essential to everything that we've been talking about. And I know you understand this, Bill, your mother growing up uh, talking about why things hurt so much, right? This is something we understand. Talk about Duende and what you're trying to do. Thank you. You can have mine if it's... Thank you. Oh, okay. I could always sing in my opera voice. Um, <laughs> I'll spare you. It's an honor to be here. Um, you know, just walking into the room, I want to share a story. I first came to APAP when I was 17 years old as an intern and uh, with my mentor, Ken Fisher. And if someone had told me then that I would be back here years, many years later, um, to be able to share my thoughts to the people that I consider the leaders in my industry. I never would have believed that. So today is real affirmation that dreams can come true on a personal level. And I just share that with all of you first time comers and, and all of the interns here. Keep your dreams big. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Duende? Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's good. That's great. I had not. Uh, my opera career really was focused very much and continues to be on the role of Carmen. And I was once in rehearsal with a Spanish stage director and he said, necesita mas, mas duende. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what is this? You know, go home and I Google it. And um, I realized it wasn't something I was gonna be able to do for the next rehearsal. So duende is a concept that was really originated by Federico Garcia Lorca, Spanish playwright, poet, author, composer. And he defines it as the mysterious power that we all feel, but no philosopher can explain. He describes it as something intrinsic to an artistic experience. It's not about technique. It's not about the perfect performance. For him, it was really about something primal, visceral, authentic. He also says it's the bitter root of human existence. So in English, I think the word that comes to my mind is soul. And as I started to really think about this concept, I wanted to follow this, his search for Duende, and I now consider myself on a search for Duende, because I think it's something that we all can identify, whether it's in a conversation, an artistic experience, it's that intimacy and it's that truth. And so how can we really isolate that? What is the formula? And Lorca really gives us some wonderful examples of his own search and what he comes to conclude. But it's about having the courage to face your fears, to face death as a fear that we all have in common, and really take a look at what's important. So this is the work that I am now continuing um, on my own search, um, which has really led me from my journey as, let's say, an interpreter, as an opera singer, to the path I hope will lead me to being an artist. Because I think that artists are the ones that are sort of given that responsibility of the mysterious and the big questions. We have an obligation to ask the questions that we're faced with. Um, and I think that mysterious is a word that keeps coming up, whether it's through Lorca, through readings, as your book states, um, referring to the mysterious, but also just to finish, a quote that really comes to my mind very often when I see 
an artistic performance is um, something that Albert Einstein said, which is the most beautiful experiences that we can have are the mysterious. Thank you so much. And of course, um, when, we, when we think about the mysterious and we think about the whole idea of making the arts matter, um, you know, there's this question I think about what can we really do if we, at any rate, often come from this particular place of ambiguity, searching and questioning in a world that sometimes would like to have answers. Paula, when I looked at that fabulous uh, clip just now, I noticed that so many of the figures were leaping. What are they leaping for? And how does that leap, anybody can answer this, how does that leap help us in the world we're in now, Kathy Edwards started us with a very sobering reminder of what's in the world right now. What, 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 what are we leaping for in the arts? What are we gonna, how does that help? Do you mind if I jump in here? Go right ahead, please do. <laughs> I, no, no pun intended. But you know, <clears throat> um, Michael Kaiser uh, was advising dance companies who want to um, play big houses and they want to up their numbers. Now, I don't know if, he, if Michael's around, if he still says this, but a couple of things. On your poster, have a man, and a man in the air. Now, that's a very, that is a very pragmatic way of marketing. People respond to those two things. Now, there's a, yeah, the beautiful dancer, was she doing Kitri or something at, at the end there? Yes. Uh, that's beautiful as well, but something about the culture. If you want to sell tickets to the T Kennedy Center as a dance company, get a young guy in the air leaping. Now, many of us are saddened by that. Uh, right, Paula. So I'm not sure that's why they're leaping. That's that. <laughs> Now, you might I, have a good marketing know, this, person. The, yeah, so the reel that we shared with you is our programming for just this season. And I, every time I look at that, I see, um, when I look at that video, I think of people that are trying to soar from Earth. And there's something that's very aspirational about that. And really trying to... Um, stretch the boundaries of what's possible by casting yourself into the air. To me, it is exuberance, it is joy, it is everything that we, you know, seek. That to me is what I see when I see that. I didn't know about Michael Kaiser's man dancing thing, but I, I, I don't. But, I didn't but know you can about understand that. it. I, I could understand it, but I think that what we want to capture in what that is, which is a promotional video to get people excited about a range of things that we're doing that there is, there is passion, there is joy, there is energy, and they need to be a part of it. And you know what, I think we have no fight here. I just want to go back even to the president. To what? I, to the president. And yeah. I want to touch base on Duende. Yeah. And unless I seem like a, a curmudgeon and, um, and crusty, I, I, I confess to you, I'm conflicted right now. But what the president is saying sounded to me like um, I love him. I really love him, but it was a speech that was designed to brand an administration. It was a speech that was designed to flatter your public. Um, does he really think we're big hearted? Uh, I don't think so. We're I, he might. Well, I, uh, he's a smart man. I do think that he is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's. He took, a he took a chance and sang Amazing Grace. How many presidents oh, no, no, ever no, no, did that? No, in no. He, per he personally. I think his heart is on his sleeve. I do. Him crying, that's what I love about him. But in his position, you've got to put a mirror to the people. And then, what was this? I'm always quoting this act as you would be. You know? So you flatter people that you're the, the greatest, this, you're the greatest. You know, I'm, I, don't, I think we have to, when I hear that, I see public relations. Flatter or inspire. But does it matter in a right. way? Does it matter whether it's public relations? If somebody, again, does it matter if it's marketing? Does it matter if, it pub, if it's public relations? If it does inspire it? I want to I want to Anna, Anna here, among, here among us, yeah. let's get real. I think, well, I think some people you know, here. How many of you were inspired by the notion that we could reach for unconditional love? Applaud if you were. But 
let's, to let's, sell, let's to take sell something, tickets. Bill, let's, I want to cast a question, and mm -hmm. I, I'm going to start again with Carla, that comes from the piece you just gave us. Mm -hmm. Are we a community? Are we a community? I as want in each one of you to answer that. And by the way, we only have nine more minutes, and then we're going to open to the... To the <laughs> but I want each of you, from your point of view, are we a community? Yes. In what way? As human beings. Now, I feel very strongly about this. As someone who is Mexican and Bulgarian and born here, I've had to struggle with three cultures, three identities. I still can't make sense of it. And I've asked myself, what's my tribe? Where do I belong? What box do I check? Am I an other? How does all this work? I've been asking myself these questions for a long time. And I've also had the chance to travel quite a bit internationally as an opera singer. And I come back to this every single time. It's what we all have in common. I frankly would like to stop the conversation about the others and start the conversation about the all, because we are all one. And you look at the statistics, this is a conversation we are going to have to have. There's a census poll last year, 2014, children under the age of five that were minorities were actually 50.2%. Now, by the that, year, so Paula, yes, what's important we think about community, and this is a reality. What's important about the word public in PBS? Are we a community? Are we a public? Yes, and I think that's the most important word in our name, um, in that it really helps to capture the fact that we exist for the communities that we serve. And by community, coming back to yours, it means you know, physical communities in place, but it means communities of common interest. And I think the artistic community in particular is a tremendously important community that we feel um, that we want to support and, um, and do whatever we can to come together around a sense of common purpose. Because I think that so oftentimes when we talk about public, when we talk about community, we're always focused on those things that make us all different and separate. Well, we're not like you, or we're not like you. We're, this is this kind of community, or that kind of community. And I think the more that we can come together around public, about that that unites us, about that common vision What can of people what in this group who have buildings, some of them, uh, have, have marketing, some of them, what could they do to enhance this idea of public, of community, of coming together? How could the arts be a part of that? From, you've been all the way across the country. From my perspective? Yeah, what could this group do? I, I think the biggest thing that this group can do is that we need to bring people in. We need to make sure that people recognize that this is why the public piece is so important that the arts and these buildings and the marketing and whatever it is we're building is for all. It is, it is what um, I, I, I sincerely believe, what I said in my opening remarks, I believe that the arts are what define us as human beings, that, that desire to express our creativity. And I think that as organizations, the more that we can tap into that and develop that into the communities that we serve, I, I believe we, we build the communities in which we want to live. And I think at the very center of that are the arts. And that's what role every person in this room, including the public stations, play. So Bill, I mean, you've broken form, you have, you've worked in every single genre. You're asking the question, are we a community? Are we one? And as a leader in the arts, once we get the community inside, what do we want them to do? Well, I'm not going that far. I, I, am, I, don't, I don't think that we're set up to have the discussion. I read every day coming in with my friend driving, my husband driving, we're reading Ulysses. We're reading U what? Ulysses, James okay. Joyce. That book was not made for a community. That book, and I, this is something I am conflicted. The man that stood on the stage and said he was scared is actually trusting, my, trusting you. But I don't know if it's, it's hard to, it's not that easy to get community. It is not so easy to get community. And we can maybe someday get it. But I think the, the, the level of speaking that we're going through right now is too easy. Because you know how difficult it is to get people to get into a room who are different color, who have different, I have nieces and nephews who don't care about the evening news. 
They know exactly what they want, and we're more fragmented. Now, is that reason to cavell and, and cry? It's a reality, and I thought that this is a room full of very realistic people. Building community is hard as hell. So let's not congratulate so what have you, ourselves. Yes, yes, and what have you learned so far? I'm sorry? What have you learned so far about it? Right? I think, You've been doing the work, oh, so what yeah, have you yeah, learned yeah. so far? Lead with your heart. Lead with your heart. What have you learned so far about community, especially growing up and in, uh, coming into a world of cultural confusion? What do you know about community? Well, I think it's Sitting about, in a house with a Mex Mexican mother and a Bulgarian father. <laughs> I think it's about listening. And I think it's about creating trust. So as much as it's leading with heart and vulnerability from my side, it's also about hearing the other person, getting to understand their side of the story. And once that trust is built, it's about advocating for their story. To me, so much of what we do is, is really about honesty and storytelling. And I think that listening is a big part of that. All right, so this world right now that, that Kathy Edwards uh, outlined in a, in a very real way in getting, let's get real, do the arts matter given what we have in front of us? What can we do? How can we leap beyond real fear? Anybody take that. Absolutely, the arts matter. <laughs> Um, you know, to me, there are two primitive functions to the arts. One is the self-reflection. I was reading Aristotle this morning on my way over um, and came across a quote, and I'm going to butcher it, but it was something like, the, the most important test in life is to know oneself in order to become efficient. So I think that's really important because the more we reflect on ourselves, the more we hold that mirror to ourselves and think about who we are, the better we can contribute to society, the more we can create empathy and compassion and so forth. But it's also about creating community. So as much as it's about the personal journey, it's about the other as well in terms of, of the greater good. And when I talk about community in that sense, I really mean humanity. It's about a reminder of what we have in common, why life is important. But how do we deal in a world where the exact opposite is very real on the news? Uh, have, have any of you performed in a war-torn country? I mean, a, I'm the non-performer on this I know, stage. But I'm, I'm terrified, and I didn't read Ulysses or Aristotle this morning. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, 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 do, I do believe I do believe, you know, to my very soul that, that the arts matter now more than ever because I do believe that it is through art that we can bring people together and that people from very different... But how do we deal with, say, hard. for example, financial stuff? Like, you know, the fact of uh, what's the price of Hamilton right now or, or even what's the price to come, you know, to, your, to, to see you? I mean, what about that? What about that? Or, 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 or the kids who are quite, quite far from any of this stuff we're talking about. How, how do we, what do we do about that? How do we well, get them know, in there? I, I, would, I would, maybe the way to answer that is that we must have a kind of faith, do we dare use that word in this room, F-A-I-T-H, and the, um, the idea that art, I think first and foremost, before we get to the kumbaya, art has to educate people to the fact that we as human beings hold multiple realities at one time. Things are and they are not. That is really difficult for most people, that things are and they're not. And we all meet each other at different points in history. I mean, we with, bring yes, different yes. histories. Now those are very, it's easy to say, but very hard for people to cope with uh, if you want a fundamental take on what the meaning of life is. An artist saying, there ain't none. Can you deal with that? Now, now, your job is to actually package and sell complex, conflicted work. Well, complex, conflicted work, work nonetheless rendered simply. I mean, it's extraordinary, yes. well, well extraordinary simplicity what you did. Right before I go to the audience, Paula Kerger, who studied pre-med, give us a quick remembrance of a piece of art that healed you. <laughs> I... Um actually have experiences all the time uh, that um, 
as I've wrestled through uh, a very painful part of my life with the loss of someone. Um, and I, I, don't even, I can't even speak about it. And I was actually in a music performance. And I don't know whether I was listening to the performance um, and I don't know what it was, but something felt different inside of me. And I, I, I know that's not very elegantly described, but I have had powerful experiences in the theater. I have had powerful experiences at the opera. But I, there was something almost primal about how something came back together inside of me, sitting in that, in that performance space. And I think, um, I, as I think back about it, um, so thank you for triggering all of this, Anna. Um, <laughs> I, I, I believe that could have happened to me sitting in my home listening to the music, but I don't think so. There was something about being in a space with other people who were all experiencing it at the same time and the power of it, and it was a piece of music by Philip Glass, by the way, and the power of it was so profound that even to this day I, I tingle a little bit thinking about it. I think that's what, when art really does touch us, it, it, it is, there's an intellectual side, there is a emotional side, but there's something even deeper that I, I think we can't even begin to imagine. And Well, that's the mystery. That's the mystery. Let's hear from you a couple of questions. Our time is short, but uh, if we had more time, we would be brief, I understand. Nonetheless, come to the mics, ask us, ask us a question, or say something. You are the community. You are the community. Yes, there's mics uh, in the extreme miles. Yes. Here's somebody coming. Tell us your name and where you're from and what you do as a maker. Sasan. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a presenter. I'm from Amherst College. My name's Elisa Pierce. From Amherst? Am Amherst, actually. There's no Amherst. Age. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to be seeing you soon. Um, and I, Moonlight, I work on climate change. I'm so worried I can't sleep about it. It keeps me up all night. And I do all kinds of things that are not the arts. And as I grind through this and think about it and find community around it, the thing that I came right up against was we need art. We need art about this change. We need art to explain how we feel. We need art to give us a vision of where we could go. I mean, Vijay Iyer came and spoke with us about his Veterans Dream Project and, and the idea that we and you makers, we create a space where we can leap, a space where we can imagine, like I think what the president kept saying, we can jump, we can hop over something. And the amazing thing about human beings is that they're capable of so much more than they're grinding on. And the arts can show you that in a heartbeat. Because people come to a performance with a very open heart. They come to education with a very open heart. They bring you their best selves. And those are the people we get to talk with. But not always. Sometimes well, they are grumbling, it wasn't their idea. Sure, but, but and I, again, also as, as, as the president said in his speech, you know, there's going to be, not everyone's going to agree, but I believe, and this is why I do what I do, is we got to reach people because this is how we're going to jump. This is how we're going to solve things. This is how we're going to celebrate. This is how we're going to move forward, so. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I saw someone had a, yes. I think. Okay, yes. I think you first, I saw you stumbling through the aisle, and then you, sir. Tell us who you are, where you're from. My name is Rada Angelova. I, um, I'm from Bulgaria, actually. And oh, wonderful. <laughs> Hi. I had to give you a shout out because I've been coming to APAP since 2007, and I never ever meet anybody from Bulgaria. <laughs> <laughs> And so this is wonderful. Uh, thank you for being here. I am a booking agent, and uh, we had the honor as a company uh, to represent Fela on tour. 
um, that's with Columbia Artist Theatricals, and uh, that was, I think, my first experience with uh, work by Bilty Jones. Um, I'm very, I'm so emotional right now because I'm also a songwriter, and I have to thank you, Bill, for shaking us up so hard because I know how hard it is to ask these questions um, that you're asking us. Are we a community? And say, I'm so conflicted about what I'm saying right now. I'm so conflicted about how I feel right now. And uh, I understand it because this is where the makers are. This is where how the creators, the artists are feeling when they're sitting by themselves in their small little room and are trying to understand, you know, and are trying to find the courage to say all these things to the world. And they just don't know if, if people would get them. And, um, and that's a scary thing. And, hey, and, hey, hey. And, and thank you for just asking these questions um, and, and shaking us up and asking us, are we a community? Because when I started coming here, I was asking myself, you know, oh my God, I'm so, I feel so lonely. And, um, and everybody has been wonderful. I'm still here. Um, Sounds like something you wrote. Thank you. Thank you. For thank you. This. Thank you so much. Yes, tell us who you are, where you're sure. from. Yes, uh, hi, my name is Paul. I'm from San Francisco. and I. I uh, work for a company called Vendini, but I'm also a songwriter and producer in my spare time, as, as I'm sure we all are. Um, my question's about, obviously, we're at an arts conference, um, but my question's about community. Um, I like the statistic, um, Paulo, that you gave about 44% of people having done something with art uh, related, and, and you know that was a really powerful statistic. Um, I watched an interview recently with David Bowie, who in 1999 said that um, the renaissance that will be created by the internet will mean that artists will be forced to work with their community and to listen to their audiences. Yeah. How do you think that's transformed art, music, um, and the way that we, I guess, I guess to, I don't know, the way that we soar um, in arts? Well, it's probably that it is happening, because there's a lot out there about civic engagement, uh, right? And so it's probably an experiment that everyone in this room is a part of right now that may have started as how do we deal with the graying of the audience, but as we see from, from this group right here even, it's something more substantive than that. But, Paula? But I think it's, it's, I mean, this is such an amazing time because we see, I mean, from my business and my colleague Ira Rubenstein is going to be in a panel tomorrow talking about digital, you know, um, the, the tools are available to give people an opportunity to express themselves in very different ways. And, you know, it, it used to be in, in film that there was a much smaller group that could play around with this material. Um, but now, you know, kids have the opportunity to, um, to tell stories in ways that really express something quite deep, I think. And, I th and for, from my perspective, I think that um, being able to create something and then, so of course there's the larger makers movement, of course, and, um, and our offices are in, in uh, Crystal City, which I know sounds like Oz, but actually it's, a, it's across from the Reagan Airport in Washington. And um, there's a maker studio there, and the number of young people that, you know, that have access to tools and material and that are building things, and just the creativity is, is so extraordinarily important. And so I think that part of it is just this yearning and desire. You know, when I went to school, kids wanted to write the great American novel. Now they want to make the great American film. And, um, or the great American piece that they can post, that they can share their feelings. But here's the great part, and that people can comment back. So it really creates something that becomes a conversation. And that, to me, is really powerful and exciting. And so as you look at the work that these kids are building, and as we, in public media, look for ways that we can support them and showcase their work and try to connect and do what we can around the edges, they, they don't really need us. 
uh, because they can do it on their own, but if we can be part of that, and if arts organizations can be part of that as well, I think that's enormous. I think Bowie was in tre uh, tremendously pressing on, on so many, uh, in so many ways. But I think the, the comment that, uh, the quote that you made about, you know, just the, the um, ability of the internet to create a platform where people can share their creative expression and to encourage people that may not think of themselves as artists to create is extraordinarily powerful. Let's take, uh, I think we'll have time for one more from the audience for now. Yes, sir. Tell Thank us who you. you are. Yes, my name is Donald Sutton. I am a personal manager. Um, I represent a number of African-American playwrights, uh, among whom is Ntozaki Shange, uh, the author of For Colored Girls. Um, I am not interested in putting anyone on the spot, but I wanted to remark and hear the panel speak in a, a little bit greater depth about Bill's point. Um, and I'm referring to the shock that I feel from having heard this item that the way to promote a season of dance, at least in New York, was to put a man on the poster uh, in the air. This is exactly the word that I was told by who was then my boss, Alvin Ailey, over 30 years ago, as we prepared what was then my first and his 20th city center season. Um, it's a question that I think Antizaki has addressed uh, continuously for 40 what is, years. What is the question? The I mean, question Kaiser is, worked for Ailey, of course. Why so. is the truth spoken by a man truer than the truth spoken by a woman? And we have a woman running for president. Anybody who wants to take this on, why is the truth spoken by a man? I don't know, than <clears throat> sir, I don't know if you've seen, uh, let's just talk about the Ailey people. They're very, very successful and they're very talented, but they have women that on those posters leaping with the verve and expressivity that used to be seen only in male dancers. So I think maybe let's get rid of the gender part. And Michael, please forgive me, I brought this up. Maybe you don't feel this in room. I think it's about this very simple, primal energy. People go to dance, and this is a problem for my world, because people don't do big jetés all the time. But people, don't, people go to dance to actually see something, oftentimes, the popular audience, do something I cannot do. Martha Graham called them acrobats of God. Now, in my world, we've been fighting against that. But then again, my world has a real crisis of conscience. Are we really trying to be popular? Are we really trying to get people at every economic level to buy a ticket? Or is it for a crowd of people who are in the know? These are, these are questions that we're asking at New York Live Arts. So please, let's take the gender out of it. You know? But what is there the public wants to see acrobats of God or as I said to Jesse once, a sweaty epiphany. <laughs> sweaty epiphany? A sweaty epiphany. People pay for a sweaty epiphany. Well, I think they want, I mean, again, to go back uh, to the, the extraordinary gift you gave us earlier. You know, they want to know, don't you get weary? Don't, which is interesting. Don't you get weary now? Or don't you get weary? Right? Don't you get weary, right? That's the part. I don't think those people going home at the end of the day's work were asking that question. Don't you? We, we, yeah, we are really weary. Don't you get but weary? But no, they were encouraging each other. Walk, walk. Don't you get weary, child. Yeah. Don't you get weary. Don't you get weary. No, I don't, I don't think there's, that's a, something kind of existential in modern uh, 20, 21st century about the question. Uh, don't you get weary? Yeah, we all get weary. Life is tiring. But what are you gonna do, collapse in the road? No, you gotta move your ass, excuse me. You gotta move oh, home. Wait, 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 wait. Well, let's stick on this for just a second because we're coming into our last lap of talking. You should put the timer on because I'm gonna lose track. Is it time now to quit? Okay, so then the last given, don't you get weary. I, I mean, I would love the two of you. I'd love, could you have a show where we could have the two of them talk about the Negro spiritual and duende? Yeah, yeah, okay. But I, I, I you know, uh, I, I, I've, got, I've got the cut sign, and so I just want to end because of Don't You Get Weary and the notion of we always, we think in art, we give hope, we make that leap. Just one sentence, starting with you, Bill, and ending with you, uh, our, our, uh, our opera singer. Um, what inspires you? 
What inspired you today? Uh, when I see someone, when I see something that is made of pain and pleasure and something that is fearless. I'm, I'm inspired when I see someone's eyes open to something that had never occurred to them before. I'm inspired by courage, especially with children. Recently spent a lot of time with kids that face such huge questions. They're worried every day that their mom, who's here illegally, is going to be deported. They're worried about major adult problems. And they go to school, and they deal with that. And English is not their first language. And yet they have hope, and they have courage. And I see what they deal with, and that gives me a lot of strength. Thank you. And you inspire me because of all you do to get the work that we make out there. Thank you for spending five days. Thank you all very much for such a candid, provocative conversation. It was a great way to launch our conference. Please, another round of applause before you leave for this fantastic panel. Please, please, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's time to make our way to next door to the opening reception. Thanks again to PBS and their staff. They've been great to work with. Thank all of you. Please have a fantastic conference.